Hello everyone, my name is Alex Rossman and I'm honoured to be here in AR Rahman's music studio here in Dubai to answer your questions on NFTs. Uh, Mr. Rahman kindly invited everyone to send in their questions on this interesting, exciting new technology uh, to Twitter and Facebook. So I'll be scrolling through the replies, picking out some uh, questions to answer, and hopefully uh, after 15, 20 minutes, everyone will have a, a great understanding of this exciting new uh, technology and type of digital asset ownership. One question to kick off is from DJ Carver on Twitter, who asked, who is Alex Rustman? So I think, why are you interested in listening to me for the next 15 minutes? Well, my name is Alex Rustman. Um, I'm head of the Consumer Engagement Fund at an organization called the HBAR Foundation. And basically what that means is that I spend my time doing business development, helping both small and large enterprises engage with NFTs and more broadly what we call blockchain technology um, or distributed ledger technology. So one of the things I've been doing for the last five years really is speaking to different people about NFTs and the different use cases that they can implement with this technology. So many people are asking actually, you know, what is an NFT? Uh, so an NFT stands for non-fungible token. Uh, and it really relates to an incredibly broad range of assets. But specifically, we're talking about digital ownership here. If you can have a non-fungible token, an NFT, then there's also fungible tokens. And fungible tokens are something like a dollar note. If you have a one dollar note, then you'll easily interchange that with other one dollar notes. They're fungible because it doesn't matter which dollar you have, they're all the same. A non-fungible token is something that's unique and provably owned. So if you have that one dollar note and suddenly Mr. Rahman signs it, then suddenly that one dollar note is worth something different from other notes. Uh, some people might say, well, this is now not you know, a currency. Other people would say this is a collectible, this is special, this has a unique history where Mr. Rahman picked it up and signed it for someone. It suddenly has a story. And NFTs are unique because they are stored uh, on something called a blockchain. Essentially, you can see that as, as a public, you know, transparent database. So instead of you know, trusting your bank to you know, tell you what you own and what other people own, suddenly everyone has a copy of this ledger, of this database, and you can check whether something is authentic or not. So when I create a digital currency, you know, something like Bitcoin you might have heard across, um, or a non-fungible token, um, which we'll be looking at very shortly, on the blockchain, everyone can see it's come from me. I have placed it on the blockchain and I've sent it over to you know, my colleague or Mr. Rahman. So you can track that ownership and that transparency gives a lot of added value and usability. How the price of an NFT reached $69 million, after all, isn't it just a photo? And what is the thought process of the buyer? Okay, so this question is about a piece of digital art by an artist called Beeple, which sold for $69 million. So this is a great example of an NFT. Uh, it is a provably owned digital token, so you can see on the blockchain you know, who owns it. Um, and it's associated to a 2D image, uh, a type of file we call a JPEG. And this 2D image was a compilation of all of the pieces of art that the artist Beeple had made put into a collage. And this was bought for $69 million. And many people say, well, I can view this image online, I can screenshot it, I can right click, I can save it. Why is it valued at $69 million? And why this artist? Um, and I think, first of all, this really speaks to the fact that you know, we as humans, we're collectors, we like to own things. And we also like to be associated with pieces of, pieces of art and artistic movements that other people are enjoying. So owning this piece of art by Beeple isn't about saying no one else can enjoy the image. It's about saying I'm the person who has received this copy from the original artist. I'm a supporter of the artist. I'm involved with him. I'm close to the culture. And most importantly, you can maybe see it as a patron. Um, and this is not unique to this point in history. When you look back to the Italian Renaissance, for example, the Medicis uh, were a very, very wealthy family who spent a huge amount of their income, perhaps today valued at about half a billion dollars, on museums and statues and paintings, uh, sponsoring pieces of art like the infamous David actually started 
uh, where she sort of resurged <laughs> the, the sort of art movement of naked statues, for example. So this idea of patronage, where you're helping bring pieces of art into existence and linking yourselves, associating yourselves with the art, is something that's not new to human history, but now blockchain, that transparency, that ability for anyone to go online and say, ooh, this Beeple image is, is really exciting, this speaks to me, uh, who owns it? You can quickly see who owns it, how much they've spent on it, how in demand it is, and that is something that gives value to the owner. And there's many different kinds of use cases for NFTs, but again, that ability to you know, transparently show who owns something and the path of history of that asset is, is very powerful. How to buy and sell NFTs. Well, I really see this as a question about how can I engage with NFTs myself? So first of all, you're going to need what we call a, a blockchain wallet, a, a digital wallet. And this is an application that you can download on your phone or uh, in your com on your computer, in your browser. And this is about how you hold one of these NFTs, one of these non-fungible tokens. If you want to hold a currency, you'd need to download a banking app. If you want to hold a blockchain asset, an NFT, you need to download a blockchain app, an NFT app. Except this is more powerful because with a banking app, you can only hold the currencies and the assets that your bank can manage. With an NFT app, you can hold many different NFTs from any issuers you know, across many different networks often. So you need to find a blockchain wallet. The, the most popular out there is, is an application called Metamask. I work with great teams like Hashpack, Exact, and Blade Wallet who are producing next generation blockchains supporting different networks. But once you have this, this is like your digital backpack uh, or maybe your sort of digital wardrobe if you're collecting pieces of digital fashion, which is a growing trend. And once you have that wallet for your holding these digital assets, you can go somewhere uh, like an NFT marketplace where you can buy these NFTs and accumulate them. You don't always have to buy NFTs. Sometimes you can share your, your blockchain address kind of like your email address for these special blockchain tokens, these NFTs, and you receive them in free giveaways um, and in different events. But often people are going to a marketplace and buying an asset to sort of start off their journey. Do you think there's a market for unsigned, not popular niche musicians? Do you think NFT is another thing that has more to do with business than art? So a lot of people ask you, should I be getting involved with NFTs? As an artist, as a, as a musician, I'm, I'm not signed, I don't have a big following. And actually, this is one of the most exciting pieces about NFTs. It really does not matter you know, how big or how small your community is, because a big uh, usability aspect of NFTs is building a community. Uh, so many artists have a very small following, um, and you know, they're looking to engage that following. So how do you make your know, early followers of your music and your art excited to be part of a movement, excited that they're going on this journey with you, that you know, over time your community is going to get a lot bigger? People want to feel that they were there at the start. They want to you know, stamp a collectible to show that you know, when this artist blows up, they were there early. And so every musician has a community at the, you know, at the early stages, and that's the community where you want to keep them coming back, you know, either attending your events or tuning in online to sort of AMAs and different sort of interactions with you as a brand and as a, um, as a group, perhaps, as a band. So by giving out these NFTs, you're saying to your, your early fans, hey, I acknowledge you, I recognize you. And that's something you can do for free, you know, just proving you went to an event or proving you logged in to do an online AMA. You're recognizing that attendance. And then also selling NFTs to those kind of your super fans who want to have something unique, want to feel they've received something. Yes, it's digital, but it's provably scarce and it has gone from the artist directly to the consumer. And that's something where when you look at some of the most successful artists in the, in the NFT space, for example, um, a, a famous electronic musician called RAC, he recently said he's made more, he's made more revenue from five super fans over the last few years than from the 3.5 million streamers on Spotify. And that really speaks to the fact that yes, you can still be streaming to a huge community, but there's gonna be a, a small number of individuals who are going to want to do more than stream your music on Spotify. They're gonna to want to do more than just attend the live events and buy the t-shirts. They're going to want to buy these digital assets as well. And it's a very strange experience that I've found suddenly wanting to have a bit more of a special interaction with a brand or with an experience. In terms of music, how would NFTs be any different from existing platforms like YouTube or Spotify? 
So the NFT, as we've spoken about, is a proof of ownership. You prove that you own that non-fungible token. And anyone can authentic or like authenticate the fact that you do own that token. So to use the example of YouTube and Spotify, these are platforms that hold music files and they allow people who subscribe to the service to stream that music file and enjoy it. So a use case for an NFT could be that when you prove ownership of that NFT to YouTube, you can unlock a special video or maybe a 3D experience to enjoy. And what is special about that is that the ownership of the NFT sits outside of the platform. So with that same NFT, you could go to Spotify and Spotify could unlock a special file that they're not allowing sort of others to enjoy. But this isn't about gatekeeping access to music. A lot of people also asked, when artists start releasing their music as NFTs, is this going to prevent other people from enjoying the music? And I would say, no, this is, about, this is not about restricting the number of people who enjoy an artist, but it's about giving added value and different experiences to a new type of um, environment, a new type of experience. So one example I love is Spotify collaborated with an artist, a UK artist called Sam Smith, and they captured him in 3D as a sort of 3D avatar. And a certain number of users they could view this 3D performance using their phone and the Spotify app. And this was a unique way of enjoying a song that everyone had access to, but this was a personal performance by a 3D digital avatar that you could move around, take, take pictures from different angles, capture with different sort of video perspectives to share with your fans and following. It really was a private performance. And so when we think about NFTs, we should really think about a token that sits outside of individual platforms, but also connects them. An artist can give a token to their fans and then tell YouTube to give these fans a special experience or tell Spotify to give them a special experience or tell a music venue to acknowledge the owners of these tokens because these tokens live independently and therefore the artists can interact and build up their fan base in a unique way that we just haven't seen before. Uh, what are the gas charges in NFTs? So. Uh, when you're looking to engage with NFTs, one of the first, you're, you're going to come across many new terminologies. One of these will be something called gas. Now, because when you're working with NFTs, you're working with a public network, this is a network that's you know, maintained by many different entities and individuals, you have to pay a, a fee for interacting with the network in order to keep supporting it, uh, because this is something that is not owned by one single organization. Um, and on, there's many different networks that support NFTs. And on some of these, the fees for using the network are quite high because there's a lot of demand, because there's not many sort of transactions that can be processed. But these fees are called gas. You could imagine when you drive a car, you have a fuel tank, and that the more you do with the car, the more fuel you're going to need, and you'll need to buy more fuel to top up. So different networks have different fees. Um, the network that I mainly work with, Hedera Hashgraph, actually has very low gas fees in the sense of only costing a few cents uh, US dollar cents to you know, make transactions or acquire NFTs. Different networks also have different environmental impacts. Again, we're working with technology that has sort of energy usage. So when you're exploring the world of NFTs, do bear in mind there are different underlying networks that these NFTs sit on. Uh, and sometimes NFTs are accused for having high costs or having high environmental costs. Um, but this is not distinct for NFTs. This is distinct to the network that they sit on. Uh, and NFT is really about that digital ownership uh, relating to that network and the DLT uh, technology. Current technology makes space on a decentralized blockchain quite premium. So this is another sort of cost tech related question. That NFT, that token itself, is really just a, an ID next to an address. Like token number 201 is owned by your, your blockchain email address. It's like token number 201 is owned by alexander.russman at gmail.com. So there's not a lot of data actually on the network, on the blockchain network itself. Uh, there's some associated network, uh, there's some associated data we call the metadata. So token ID 201 is linked to a video file or linked to an image file. And that is often stored somewhere else, somewhere more centralized, maybe you know, like uh, Google Cloud storage or um, Amazon web, web Services. And so people say this token might be decentralized, but it's just a single line of, of text. 
uh, the real asset, you know, the music asset, the art asset, the video asset is stored somewhere else and that could disappear, that could be taken down by a centralized entity. Um, and this question is often sort of not you know, acknowledging the fact that you can store more data on the blockchain, but it has a higher cost. And I think over time we are going to see more files stored in a completely decentralized manner. There are protocols such as Filecoin, Arweave, IPFS, essentially decentralized storage met methods, but they are very high cost. For me, what excites me uh, are these you know, new experiences that cannot be stolen and that can be sort of truly authentic. Um, one of the things that people ask is, you know, what are you most excited about for the future of NFTs and music NFTs? And for me, it's that proof of ownership. An NFT is like a ticket where you can claim an experience or a service. So when you have the NFT for a special musical experience, you can go somewhere like a virtual world, like a Fortnite concert, for example, a Travis Scott, a big musical artist, did a performance in Fortnite. And that is an experience that can't be scraped, that can't be pirated. But the NFT allows you to go to that virtual world and say, I have the NFT, please let me in, please let me move around this space, listen to music in different areas with different 3D models, with different perspectives, and allow me to not only interact with the art, but to some extent create my own art with unique perspectives uh, that you know, maybe you're sharing with, with friends and family uh, in the same way that you, you know, use a, a Snapchat filter, which might be rare to create content and share that. So NFTs, in themselves, they're not containing a lot of you know, creative, you know, artistic data at the moment. Uh, again, ask the question where those, where those art assets are held, but the conversation around NFTs shouldn't be you know, derailed by you know, where the asset is stored. We're really talking about that proof of ownership and how different sort of entities are able to respond and acknowledge that ownership. Intellectual property rights, copyrights, and NFTs and music and arts explain. Um, so I'm definitely not a, a a legal expert in terms of you know, the minutiae of this. But one thing I, I have to say around NFTs is that this doesn't, you know, this doesn't overrule um, existing legal structures you know, around the arts. Um, you know, often people will say when you buy the NFT, you don't really own that art. You don't really own the music or the 2D image. Um, but you know, that is very normal. When you buy a painting, you don't own the copyright of that painting. You don't suddenly have the rights to issue postcards and t-shirts of the image of that painting. You have the physical asset and you can put that in your gallery or in your apartment, but you're not able to own the copyright. Um, at least in US law, you know, that's going to remain with the artist until they die and for 70 years after that. So in terms of the legal aspects, NFTs are about, again, that ownership of something. And that something is still going to be determined as it always is by you know, laws um, you know, embedded in a jurisdiction and in human society. So while the blockchain is going to say you own this token and you've transferred this, you know, you've created the token, you've transferred it to someone else, it's no longer in your possession. How we relate that ownership, how we relate that digital data to the real world is really a space that's still being explored um, and one that you know, definitely does not um, ignore existing rules. Someone else asked, you know, can I create NFTs of content that I don't have the copyright to? And I would say, no, you, you, you can't. Um, you need to make sure you have the copyright of that image you're minting into an NFT or that music you're minting into an NFT that you're then earning revenue from. And we are going to see new types of contracts being drawn up that cover these tokens, that cover your know, revenue share from the tokens. Um, especially since now that transition of ownership makes it much, much easier to trace, for example, how royalties should be distributed. And that's going to be a really big space in terms of making sure people you know, receive you know, their, their sort of, the just income for their creative output. But this is always going to be tied, tied to sort of your real world laws. Um, and certainly, especially as the technology evolves, sometimes the technology will make mistakes and there will be sort of ownership that's incorrect on the blockchain and it's going to be you know, real world uh, so human lawyers and you know, rights managers who will uh, you know, correct that. Um, and certainly there's different perspectives on the space. Sometimes people say uh, the code is law, uh, as in the computer code is the law that we must you know, uh, abide by. Uh, but I, I like the extended version of that is the, the code is law until the code breaks. And uh, this is what we kind of repeatedly see. Um, we also have a question from Aravand who says, this is super big for an ARR fan and a music fan, um, but does owning your NFT give you access to some kind of streaming rights or earn royalties on the music NFT I buy based on the streaming? 
I think on, on that last piece, uh, the company I work for, the HBAR Foundation, is working with Mr. Rahman on launching an NFT platform on the Hedera Hashgraph network I mentioned earlier. Incredibly exciting announcement, inc incredibly exciting project, and we'll be having updates on that in the coming months. Uh, so I'll leave that to Mr. Rahman and his team to speak to uh, and to leak alpha about <laughs> over the coming months rather than myself. In terms of what these NFTs will look like, I think that question touched on you know, some of the areas in which NFTs give you rights to, to the actual content. As mentioned earlier, that's always gonna be tied into some sort of legal contract ultimately. And this is also a space that people need to keep an eye on because once you have a claim to revenue and income, then these tokens can look more like an investment asset, a security asset, which uh, becomes a more of a kind of financial good. Um, I think in terms of that more kind of financial side of things, another question we saw was you know, how do NFTs relate to the metaverse? And the, the metaverse is this concept of you know, merging together different digital experiences with our real world phil, uh, physical experience. And I'll be returning um, to Mr. Rahman's studio in March, um, again in Dubai, to run a workshop on metaverse. And I'd love to share some of that content with you. But at least for now, the relationship that I see between NFTs and the metaverse really returns to the fact that NFTs live outside of existing platforms. At the moment, you have these sort of siloed environments of your know, Spotify with its user base and the history of the users, you know, YouTube with its user base, you know, accounts and the history of those accounts and the users. And artists have to go to each of these platforms to you know, reach out to their fans, find out where they are. NFTs live on this blockchain, which really sits in all of the space between these silos. Um, and so NFTs are going to enable this metaverse experience where, again, your blockchain wallet, your NFT wallet is your digital backpack. And as you have different, you know, real, um, it's a physical and digital experience, you're collecting these tokens, you're carrying them around and you're arriving at a new platform. And that platform is able to see your past history and say, hello, Alex, you're a fan of Mr. Rahman. We see you went to his uh, co concert of the Dubai Expo. We see that you streamed his music on a, a music streaming platform. We'd like to give you a, a special experience on this new platform. Um, and that's really what excites me about NFTs. It's giving musicians and creatives back the power to engage with their fans, identify those fans, and interact with them. So until next time, uh, it's been great talking to you and answering your questions. Thank you everyone for tuning in.